Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of Timo and Julian Talk Philosophy. Uh, I'm uh, Julian Mitan, and I'm together with my uh, colleague, uh, Timo Schmitz. Uh, I'm an anthropologist, and Timo is a philosopher. Well, the topic that we will uh, talk today is actually a little bit different from what we talked in our previous podcast. Uh, we will go a little bit more to the East, to say so, and we will talk uh, about Chinese philosophy and in particular about the philosophy, uh, about the philosophy of Chuan Si. Uh, Timo um, is uh, quite knowledge knowledgeable when it comes to Chinese philosophy. And uh, he actually uh, signed some uh, papers that um, analyze various topics that concern the works of Chuan Su. So um, he will give us some um, interesting details. And I want to mention from the very beginning that I'm almost, uh, I don't have almost any knowledge about the subject. So this will be extremely interesting because today, unlike mm -hmm. in the other podcast, we are not coming from the place of somebody that is actually knowledgeable about uh, the subject. I'm coming from the place of somebody that is interested in the subject. And I will be the one that is putting the questions and Timo will be the one that will actually explain uh, to us all that concerns the, uh, um, the subject that uh, we both choose for today. So I want to welcome Timo. Hello, everyone. I'm very glad to be here today. It is a very interesting session because, as you said, indeed, I wrote a work, I wrote a book about Taoism, so to say Lao Tzu and Zhuang Tzu in German, which is called Was das Tao lehrt, eine Einführung in den Taoismus, which was published in Berlin 2017, and which, of course, is one of our primary sources today. However, for our English speakers, I have a second source, which I will particularly often quote today, because it is... A, very interesting if you want to get deeper inside. It's from uh, Fung Yolan, A Short History of Chinese Philosophy, which was published in London 1948 and is a short English version of Chung Guo Zhe Jie Bian Shi, this Chinese work. So we are, I think it's quite interesting to see Chinese philosophy and taking a primary source, an analyst, who analyzed this philosophy, who actually was from China, so that we don't get a purely European view, a Eurocentric view, but that we also this see- This is the thing that I wanted to start actually the podcast with. Uh, I think many of our listeners maybe are not so knowledgeable about Chinese philosophy, and maybe they are more knowledgeable about, let's say, what we will call generally Western philosophy. What are the main points that uh, radically differ when it comes to the philosophic view of the world through Ch the lenses of Chinese philosophy in comparison to what we know in the West? Well, there are two important things. First is uh, the time, and second is the reception. The time when Chinese philosophy had its core was the warring states. It was a period in of let's say 500 years in which the Chinese uh, little kingdoms, they fought against each other and the people, they were like seeking for peace and the philosophers had completely different ideas on how a future society, a peaceful society shall look like. And in this time, we find it's called the period of the hundred schools of thought. And of course, hundred schools, it's just a, a symbol, a symbolism. It's not a particular number, but it shows that there were plenty of thoughts, really a lot of thinkers. And in this time, we find important thoughts like of Confucius, of Lao Tzu, of Chuang Tzu, but we also find many, many others. And so this is the time when, some, when it was created. The second point is the reception, because these philosophers, especially of Confucianism, of Taoism, and later also of Buddhism, these three teachings, they influenced China until the beginning of the 20th century. So unlike in the West, where you have different uh, epochs, 
in the East, you have different dynasties. And of course, also in these different dynasties, the schools changed in their way. But Confucius was receptive as a state you philosophy usually until the end of the last dynasty. Nowadays, um, Chinese philosophy is as vibrant in, let's say, mainstream Chinese society. I mean, vibrant in the sense that it's very hard to actually say that a certain philosophical idea is concentrated in an area of society, but more as an overall um, image that people have of society. Do you think uh, that nowadays Chinese, the Chinese society usually tends more towards like a Western view where they still retain a lot of uh, the, um, let's say the philosophical heritage that they have from their ancestors? They have both kind of views because on the one hand, they have really pretty good literature on Western philosophy. They really analyzed the West very good in recent times. On the other hand, they are very proud of the heritage and they can be that proud because their heritage has a long tradition of thought and this tradition of thought is actually exported now because today you find many people who like you, you can go in a store and you find the symbol like the Tai Chi that many people know as the yin and yang symbol that they put the stickers everywhere you find people <laughs> who want want to live in harmony with nature and what, what yeah that's think? consumerism like one or yes one. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the problem it became consumerist in the beginning people in the West were interested today it is a kind of consumerism but it is all built on the fact that Chinese philosophy is exported to the West. And I mean, you, you, every philosophy can be, become consumerated. You find this with many, with many good thoughts that started and someone found like, hey, that's a good thought, it makes money out of it. So indeed, I want to, I want to uh, say that many people have therefore a wrong view of Chinese philosophy in the West because they just know what they know from consumerism and not what they, not the, not the real, Real, uh, real I think content. that might be a case for a lot of cultures that yes, come indeed. from the East, you know, as an umbrella term. But uh, when it comes to the works of trans, what um, make uh, what made you uh, concentrate your scholarly works on him? let's say in comparison to other philosophers, what usually stood out uh, about his works more than the works of others in your opinion? Well, the problem of tradition, because I mean tradition in a sense of, of uh, transmitting it to one from time to time, because we, Zhuangzi, he has only, we only have one work, from him. So we can call his work Zhuangzi as well. It later had a name, but uh, in the beginning, people re referred to the book Zhuangzi to the person Zhuangzi. And the problem that we have is that this book changed a lot. So that we even today, we have the, have the problem that we don't know what Zhuangzi actually wrote and what was later uh, adjusted. So maybe I should tell a bit about the person so that we know the problem. The point is this, we can find it at page 104 of uh, Feng's uh, chapter 10, the third phase of Taoism, Zhuangzi. He states that Zhuangzi lived on the border between present uh, Shandong and Henan provinces, where he lived a hermit's life. That's like very important in, in because other, other philosophers, they, or many others, they tried to get influence in politics, like Confucius, like he wanted to be a famous statesman, they wanted to, uh, and of course Confucius, by the way, he got important offices, so his philosophy was not realized at the time when he lived, but they try, people tried to get influences by getting office, and Zhuang Zi, he was a kind of person who did not want to get into any political office, and so he lived a hermit's life, and uh, he was actually a contemporary of Mencius, and a friend of uh, Hui Shi. Um, however, and now that's the tricky thing, and also Fung mentions it on page 104, it's a very tricky thing, that in the third century AD, a scholar named Guo Xiang changed the work in the way we know it today. I mean, the problem that we have with ancient texts is in, in China, people wrote down, wrote things down, and other people copied it but they didn't copy it by copy the work they have there. But then they thought 
that something is uh, should simply be added, they added things there and they put in their own thoughts. So every manuscript in the past there was rare, rare it was kind of dif different, you know. You, so, you you said something extremely important in my opinion. The way in which his uh, works usually were transmitted, and we can also extend to how they were transmitted in the let's say west and into let's say mainstream into the mainstream academia nowadays uh, one thing that you said is that uh, the way in which his basically uh, writings were preserved but i you said that there was a certain issue there but i also think and i i think this is extremely important for our listeners um, do you usually think that he the work uh, his work was translated very well into let's say English and other international languages? Because I know cases of various philosophers, not of Eastern ones, more of like let's say Western philosophers, like ones from Italy and political thinkers, that they. Uh, uh, works were translated into English, into French, and so on. And many of the uh, core principles of their concepts, many of the concepts that were actually created by them, they, uh, that were introduced by them through their works, were like mistranslated and they kind of got lost or they become very blurry in the translations that were produced in other languages. Do you think there is also an uh, issue here? With, uh... Yes, definitely. We find this both with Lao Tzu and with Zhuang Tzu because actually with, with Lao Tzu it's even more complicated because I have seen a lot of translations and because he wrote in a kind of a verses, uh, you find a lot of ways on how you can translate something. So people translated it completely different. And the same thing is with Zhuang Tzu. The writing style of Chinese was not like the, as grammarly, for example, than the Indians. Like when you have a Sanskrit text, you can see from grammar to grammar how something is understood. But Chinese in this, in the ancient sense, was not a grammarly language. But what was more important was the stylist stylistic device. So it is a language which has many word plays and many Many, it, it really speaks through the language, but sometimes, of course, as a translator, you have the problem or not. Uh, you, you not you have you don't have the chance to translate one sentence like many times so that all meanings are are given. So you have to decide for one translation for one meaning, and another person. Uh, has an own idea on how he understands this imagery and translates it differently. So especially with Taoist literature, you often have the problem that when you read two different translations, you have the feeling like you read two completely different books. This is also the case with Zhuang Tzu, I have to say. But what the, what the main important point is because you asked me about my scholarly interest is because I, what fascinates me is the core of Zhuang Tzu. That was the answer to the first question. And what I wanted to say about this is that we don't have actually the work of Zhuang Tzu, but of his compiler Guo Xiang. So we have a so Zhuang Tzu lived long time before the work that we have today was compiled this way. And it is even probable that full completion was done by his followers, as even Kong on page 104 gives us or states us. This is very, very important to know so that we the question that always fascinated me is like, what? Who was this man? What? Who? Who? Who was this Trunks? And honestly, like most other people, I cannot give a clear answer on this because we know some chapters they have, uh, they have content uh, mentioning person and time that was definitely after his life. So he, he there are people mentioned that Trunks could not know. This is this is one thing. And on the other hand. His work is really brilliant, it's really brilliantly created. And uh, you said that uh, one of the core or the actual core of his work is the subject of tradition. Is yes. Clarify. What does he actually understand through tradition? Because many times, and especially nowadays, when you look at the discourse that concentrates around tradition, and especially in certain media, 
usually tradition is kind of it's kind of an equal sign between tradition and anti-modernism. And I think that might not be the case uh, with uh, him. What he actually meant through tradition? Well, what I mean is that on the one hand, Zhuangzi was probably the first anarchist in history. On the other hand, he was one of considered one of the most important philosophers within Chinese monarchy, Chinese dynasties. You know, so you already see the contrast. So. He, the fact was that during the time or like maybe about the Qin dynasty or maybe even in the early Han dynasty, we find the problem that, of course, uh, Zhuangzi, because he was anti-Confucian, he was anti-moralist, that to be able to put make him part of the state philosophy, we, we assume that Guo Xiang put out certain, later also put out certain things that speak against his uh, idea against the states. So he was actually transmitted in the tradition that he kept his liberty and, and anti-governmental stance generally on no matter who rules, because for, to him, rulership was, uh, was an interference in nature. We will talk about this later. And on the other hand, he was changed in a way that he was adaptable as a part of the three teachings, the state philosophy. So indeed, he was one, he became also in the Tang Dynasty later, he became one of the most influential ones, even though he was against rule. And the point why he was against rule is the warring states, because he lived in a time where countries, where small, small, small princedoms used to fight against each other. And of course, he saw what was it all about. It was about power, it was about might, it was about influence. And he was like, if everyone follows his nature, so to say if there are no states and everyone is just acting naturally and there will be no war because there's no one who has the power over others and i think that's the key actually is very close to the western the West, what did western philosophers thought like plato aristotle they thought something called eudaimonia it was, we can translate it with felicity happiness on the you said something, was trans uh, you said wait something wait wait wait, wait wait one important Schwanz did exactly search same. He was searching uh, absolute happiness. Okay, sorry for <laughs> no problem. You said something that really kind of um, uh, remained in my mind. You said uh, if uh, if everybody would act naturally, if I understood very well. Yes. But uh, this is a kind of uh, kind of pushes forward the idea that we can obtain like a type of peace and harmony but in the same time uh, there is also the idea that many conflicts between individuals and especially uh, between states you know in various forms usually are ignited by the uh, the asymmetric access to certain resources so how can this to like actually be explained well to understand why happiness is so important for him we should go and i should give a quote now from fung page 105 he says about Zhuangzi, a free development of our natures may lead us to a relative kind of happiness absolute happiness is achieved through higher understanding of the nature of things end of quote i think this is the point it's not about uh, at the first place it is not about uh resources at the first place it is about he wants to understand nature and as such and his idea is of course if everyone understands the nature and acts according to nature then there will be no more problem because nature is in harmony that's his premise and the idea is that everyone should be able to exercise in a free and full uh, extent our natural ability and Again, I want to give a quote to show what this means. Uh, actually, it's uh, from his chapter 12, quoted after Fung Yolan, uh, page 105. At the beginning, there was non-being. It had neither being nor name, and was that from which came the one. When the one came into existence, there was the one, but still no form. When things obtained that by which they came into existence, it was called the, the end of quad. You see the point? 
I mean, or shall I explain what what the what 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 the main point is here? Please, because because this is a very essential point. If to him, you know, you maybe know from the Tao Te Ching, from Lao Tzu, that, they are, that the Taoists have two main points, Tao and De. And for Lao Tzu, it was like Tao is something like an immanent God, or generally a God. It's like everything flows out of it. Everything like is a manifest, and the manifestation of it is the De. So that we kind of get, so every, because everything flows out of the Tao, it, everything comes out of the one, it's part of the one. It is a pan and hanik. Thought. Pan and Hen is Greek, like everything in one. So on the one hand, everything exists here, and but still it goes back to the one, to the Tao, who is full being. And now, what does Trang Tzu say about it? He uses the same terms. He talks about Tao and the. And to him, the is natural ability. It means that if our nature is freely developed, we can freely exercise our natural ability. And he has a very, very interesting thought about this. If I want to translate this now in Western terms so that we know actually what, 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 he, what he means. When he, when he talks about happiness, the Western term is actually, or as, as we would understand it, is nature. Nature is happiness. And the opposite is culture, as we know it from our first, from our first session, and to trans. Culture means pain or suffering. So man is the source of suffering and because he culturizes the world. So the de is something like, uh, it comes out of the divine. The nature, as man, we have a natural ability which goes back to the big one, to God, to, to, to the divine. And because we act against our nature, that's the idea of trunks, because we act against our nature, mm -hmm. then we suffer. This is very interesting because you pointed out the idea that nature is in harmony. But if we usually observe nature in all of its, let's say, mightiness, you know, uh, like as a system, you know, when we yes. usually see yes. nature as a system, we usually see the fact that in order to let's say be a certain type of harmony nature usually goes through cycles of destruction and renewal and usually as humans when we see earthquakes tsunamis volcano eruptions we usually see them as destructive and as acts of violence because uh, in themselves they are not acts of violence but the way in which we perceive them through our human minds, we see them as violent and uh, the fact that they usually create suffering. So uh, like usually nature has a balance, but the balance that nature has usually always kind of um, is based on this cycle of uh, birth, uh, destruction and renewal. And usually when I hear mostly people talking about nature is in balance, they kind of have this idea that in nature, everything is harmonious and it kind of lacks of any type of violence, even though we can say that we perceive violence through the lenses of our human culture, and that maybe violence doesn't exist as a thing in the natural world. Well, well, you have to see that's typical Western thought. It's a, it's not problem for Trump, yes. This but... this is why I brought it up because we need to see what is like the difference, the contrast. You know, for for in nature in Chinese, it's often called zhan. It means like a self. So it's just the it's it's the thing if you don't intervene in it. If you don't interact, that's nature. And I told you that also the Chinese, in, from time to time, the Chinese got their own, got their different, their own idea of the word culture, Wenhua. I talked about this in, uh, in our very, very first session, so I don't want to put it up again. What is interesting, however, is that Zhuangzi sees culture actually like we did see it in the West. Culture is what man adds to nature. And because he wants that man lives in nature, culture is suffering. So. So if, if man adds something to nature, he is actually a kind of, let's say, abusing nature. And here it gets interesting when we look into his political and social philosophy, 
because I want to cite again Fung, this time on page 106, he writes, the purpose of all laws, morals, institutions, and governments is to establish uniformity and suppress difference, end of quote. I mean, you know this, you have a law, and this law counts for everyone in the same way. But the problem that Zhuang Zi sees is that every person is differently, so one law, which applies to everyone in the same way, is against the diversity of mankind because people are too different to be put in one uniform. And so it is the same like uh, water is life to the fish, and but it is death to man because we cannot live always under the water. And so it's the same. And the problem that Trunk sees is that governments may have a good intention, but uniformity does not bring good results because people are too individual. And so, and now I want to quote Fung again. This is why Zhuang Tzu violently opposes the idea of governing through the formal machinery of government and maintains instead that the best way of governing is through non-government. And quote. So the point is, like when everyone uses his natural ability, and of course for Zhuang Tzu, people are good when they are not in a state of war. I mean, he lived during a time of war. So he thought like that if there was no war, people are good. That's another question whether this is true. What I find really fascinating, and this is like turned out, uh, turned on like a light bolt in my head, is the fact that this is extremely different from what I know through, let's say, the European perspective, because I see even with this, let's say, revival of old religions and nature-based religions, you know, like paganism, neo-paganism, the fact that basically man usually observes nature and culturalizes it. And this way he thinks that he can be more in a harmony with nature, like through like a very culturalized, understanding of the nature, especially through rituals, through symbolism, and so on. I think this like is very in a total opposition with what you said earlier, because nature and culture usually are kind of incompatible uh, through, uh, this is like the conclusion that I came through, uh, through listening to you. Actually, the beginning, chapter one, the beginning is, brilliant because you have like a fish and you have a bird one and the point is the fish can has to live in water and the bird has to live in in the sky and they and it seems that this this that uh, that the fish he, he he can he can he he has to live to his nature the bird and the bird is a big is larger bird and a smaller bird and the larger bird and the smaller bird they, they all live in harmony they have no trouble because both are completely different. Both are, they are both birds, but the one has a smaller beak, the other one has a larger beak, but it's no trouble to them because uh, everyone is happy as long as, the, as, the, as they can live the way they ought to live. And I guess the idea is kind of, if you cannot, you cannot uh, make the bird happy by, by making his beak bigger, you know? In the same way, you cannot make people happy by making them uniformly, because one, some people are like this, other people are like that. And one person is happy with this, and the other person is happy with that. So you cannot force the people like there is only one right way. And I think this is the, he starts this from the very, very beginning with the fish who turns into a bird and the bird who turns into a fish. And when he is a fish, he has to live in water. And when he is a bird, he has to fly. That's what he has naturally to do. You know, when I hear this, like um, if you take, uh, if I would uh, tell what you said earlier to somebody, I think the most superficial conclusion that, um, we some people would uh, approach is the fact that we should be as individualistic as possible. I, I yes, mean, yes. But uh, you know, in our present day, unfortunately, you can have 
this very destructive individualism with yes which is yes. very glutinous and you know and many would argue that okay uh, i understand but in if we have this approach we are basically basically dissolving the idea of society in its core principles i think i think so as well but you have to know why for trunks it is no problem it is because to him as I said, cal the, but that's what we call culture in the West, that's the problem. So when we, when we live as most individualistic today as possible, what do we want? How do we want to live most individualistic? We want to consume. So say like, so you have the ego at the first. I want to listen to this music. I want to eat this chocolate. I want to this. And this is destructive. Yes, but Trunks did not think like this because to him it is just like if you have to act naturally. Like if you have, if you, because he did not live in a technologized, technologized society. So for to him it is like if you like doing a job, just go and do this job, and you will be happy and have a living. And be like, if you if you if you are good in growing trees, you can become a farmer who grows in agriculture. If you are good in uh, in getting around with animals, then you can be like a, a farmer you who. You know what? Uh, what I see maybe as a contradiction, and I really want you to explain this. Usually, when it comes, you said with let's say activities, you know, you go and do a job and you earn a living. We usually, uh, as we were conditioned in our society, we usually think at, uh, when it comes to everything that is economic, okay, everything that is job, everything that is career, that it is very much culture-based. You cannot have like industrialization. And okay, okay, you're, you're, you're right, wait, wait. The point is, I just explained to you how Trangsa would see the world today. Trangsa did not say, like uh, you don't need technology, just do your job. It was just now the last point that I said was my interpretation of Trunks for today because we asked about how individualistic society is today. You have an important point and Trunks has an answer. Really, Trunks has an answer. You find it on page 107 of Trunks' interpretation. He writes, or Trunks writes, that the problem is uh, that we depend on something or that we are that we are dependent. And Fung writes two things that I want to, to quote to show you the answer of what Trunks would say. The first quote is uh, from Fung, page 107. Relative happiness is achieved when one simply follows what is natural in oneself. This every man can do, end of quote. And here's the point, this is relative happiness. This is not absolute happiness. You only have relative happiness by achieving following your nature but this is not enough you want to have absolute uh, happiness now what is absolute the point is and that's the second quote i want to give relative happiness is relative because it has to depend on something happen something end of quote it's on the same page and the point is this is it absolute happiness is if you are not depending on anything relative happiness is just relative because you are depending on something and, and if you are depending of some on something you are suffering because happiness which depends on anything limits our natural ability and therefore we can just be relatively happy so for trunks a real sage and that's maybe why he lived as a hermit a real sage uh, has to live uh, by being one with the nature and with the one whole. And it's not a societal friendly thought in that way that he does not, that he thinks like the best way is if you interact with everything naturally, but this means that you have to get over your emotion, your affection. Even when, uh, you know, the, but the other point is uh, the natural cause is unlike sorrow and happiness. So on the one hand, suffering to him is a penalty. And it is a penalty of what? Of violating the principle of nature. So when you suffer, then it is just because it is a penalty for you because you did violate the principle of nature and uh, suffering or sorrow is the kind of, kind of um, Open opposite of this relative happiness, but you have to even get over all this 
to get to the natural cause. And actually, I want to tell you a story in the end so that you understand why this is so this is so fascinating. Is that when the first time Buddhists came to China, uh, they the works were translated from Sanskrit to Chinese, and the, and because one did not know how to translate Buddhist words. One used the Taoist words, like for example, Zhuangzi talk the perfect being for Zhuangzi is the Chen Ren. It means like perfectionized being. That's the sage, the one who broke out of the cage. And this word was used to translate the Buddhist term Ahat. That's the one who is the is the closest to Buddhahood in Theravada Buddhism. So the thing was, when people saw the Buddhist scriptures translated, they thought that Buddhism is just a kind of misinterpreted Taoism. There was even a story like that when Lao Tzu left China to the West, that he maybe arrived, uh, that he went to, later to India and tried to explain people his Taoism and that they misunderstood it and that this is how Buddhism, that's, that's the teaching what is Buddhism. I mean, that's how people thought in the beginning because it sounded so close. And I mean, here you see the point, it sounds so close. Zhuang Tzu, to him, he sees suffering and he wants to overcome suffering. And this is why Buddhism and Taoism and all this, why they always became so close to each other because they had points of interaction. But the main core, why Chuang Tzu wrote this was Confucius. Because Confucius has a strict hierarchy. Confucius, you know, wrote that you are always in a kind of duties. You have rights and you have duties. And especially as a woman, you have always duties in front of a man. As a young girl to your father, as a, as a wife to your husband, and as a widow to your eldest son. You always have duties. And you have to respect these duties. And you always have, and if you are in higher hierarchy, you have a certain right. And people have to fulfill their duty. And Zhuang Tzu was against this, most likely. I mean, his anti-Confucian points are, are maybe from time to time to make it comfortable uh, in the Qin Dynasty. Maybe it was it was uh, some extreme views were were put out of the world. We we can assume we don't know, but we assume. And so you see, the point is like for Zhuang Tzu, all these rules, these hierarchies, these norms to him. He, 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 has, he has the exact opposite part. He says like, hey, people, you cannot be happy this way because uh, you have to understand na nature or you have to understand the creator. And actually, this is very, very close to Platonism. Once again, it is very interesting because Plato, he has the one, the good. The good is God in Plato's sense. And the good causes all the good things on the earth. This is reality for Plato. So when you have the good, uh, it, 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 has, it kind of creates, uh, he, he is like the creator. And the difference in for Zhuang Tzu is kind of, he has the one, the Tao, but this Tao is dynamic, it flows out and it flows out into this world. And therefore, because everything is a unity, a oneness, and there are not these different realms for like Plato, there is the divine realm and there is our human realm. So the realm of the ideas, the world of the ideas, the perceptional world. So God lives in another world than we do. It's actually like in later in Christianity, the immanent world and the transcendental world. But for the Chinese view, they were often more the kind of everything is imminently there. So the cosmos is a big one. It's all a oneness. And if you change something, if you culturize it, if you change it, then you are then you are actually changing something of the divine order. You are actually bringing chaos in this harmony. And that's the point. Like if a cat chases a mouse, it is natural. It is its harmony. Maybe people will say like, how is it good for the mouse? But that's the natural cause, the natural law, it's harmony. But if you start like, like uh, building dams or destroying rivers, you put the whole oneness not just a part of the oneness, but you, that in a Chinese thought, you destroy the whole oneness because everything is dependent on each other. And the problem that Chuang Tzu sees is you want to become part of the big one, but to get part of the big one, you have to get over these dependencies to realize your nature. And I want to give a, maybe a last quote for today uh, to, to show where the, what the problem is here, actually. It is, 
found on page 115 in Fung's interpretation. He writes, what, in order to be one with the great one, the sage has to transcend and forget the distinctions between things, end of quote. You see, the point is the sage, that's the perfectionized man, the Chen Zhen is a sage one. The, and he wants he has to understand the great one, the God, or this, this all-encompassing principle. But to understand it, he himself must somehow be part of that unity. On the one hand, this means dependence, because you are part of this unity. But Chuang Tzu, and this is the paradox thing, Chuang Tzu says, kind of, you have to transcend and forget that distinctions, because if you cannot, because to him, if you forget the, the distinction, like this is a chair, and this is a cow, and this is a house. But if everything is just a one, then you don't you don't do things that we do today: in grouping, out grouping. We had this about identity. Like these are my people. This is my empire. This is your empire. No, everything you have in this universe is like one, and it is just it is just there to live your life. You don't don't bother with if the things like the Confucians, because that's the point, you cannot see morality, you cannot see ethics. So all these hierarchies, these duties, Trung Tzu says, where do they come from? You don't have to proclaim ethics because if you just don't dist distinct between anything, but become part of this oneness, this, this you know, you know this from, from shamanism, this trance, this ecstasy with, with, with the world, then, it is you are simply there's nothing to bother. Then there's absolute peace and then there's absolute happiness. When it comes, I think we should do um, the last point and uh, then to make the conclusions. Sure. The one, the last thing that I want to ask you, and maybe this will be especially of interest for people that are more into, let's say, the sphere of political science because there's a lot of overlap between like political science and philosophy. Do you think that uh, the core of Ch chances works can actually be in one way or the other co uh, codified for modern, modern day anarchists? Can you see any type of uh, compatibility or something or certain aspects that can be incorporated into their view? Theoretically, yes, practically no. Because the point is that modern anarchism, like based on Bakunin and Kropotkin, they have different worldview on the, I mean, they have the same basis, like man is good when he lives in nature. If there is no law, then people can live good. But I think they both differ on the how, because modern anarchists, they reject like the church, they reject religious structures. And Zhuang Tzu, in a certain way, he is a very metaphysical person. So in the basis, you have to accept a metaphysical spiritual feeling and to, to get this insight. So both possibly have the same worldview that there's a man is good and that states are the evil because they try to uniform us and they try and they act against our ability. But when you when we both ask on the question how to get over it, I mean Chuang Tzu would never never speak for a revolution. No sense. Because a revolution is again against probably against men, because this way you start culturalizing yourself by ideology. And Chuang Tzu would not like if people start creating ideology because this is again against nature because everybody has its own mind, its own thoughts. Maybe man doesn't even know who he really is. He has a strong, he has a strong idea about this. So I think in the practice, in the practical view, it is not compatible with anarchism. It's not but, extremely but, pragmatic. Yeah, no, it, it is compatible with other thoughts like ecologically, it, like ecological parties can learn from him about like how to how to preserve nature or how to get more uh, how to get more more uh, harmony with nature so it might be it might be useful for modern politics i also think that he is rediscovered in modern china as part of the day because uh, people also in china know that today climate change is a serious issue so 
but then but they learn from their ancestors. So they say like, hey, drunks already know that we should live a, like nature, so we shall not destroy it. So there are there are again all over the world there are people who are who are who are dealing with these issues that Trunks talks about. But I don't think that it's practically useful for the left today because Trunks is really a metaphysical thinker. He's an extreme pacifist, which is good, also good for the left. But um, despite that, he is completely different from the modern left and from modern anarchism. Yeah. And now for the final conclusions, please, like in very short terms, uh, tell me like the, uh, what do you think that are the three main ideas everybody should like um, basically retain from uh, the works of Chuang Okay, the first point is happiness. Chuang Tzu has relative happiness and he has absolute happiness. And the point is that to get to absolute happiness, one has to question the dependencies. And that's the first thing. I want to add a, I want to add a by passage. Of course, I personally think that we are that nothing in this world exists independent. And I also think Trunkson knows this. So when, when he says like we have to get independent, he doesn't mean that we have to like see things each for its own, just once that we see things as they are. By passage end. So that's the first point. To achieve absolute happiness, one has to understand dependence and get rid over, over uh, um, a kind of conceptionalism, like to to see every to see things in a concept, but instead see things as they are, as in nature. The second, second one. The second one is natural ability. Natural ability for him is very important. Everyone should strive for what he or she likes. And therefore, everyone should try to achieve his life goal and fight for it. Without, without weapons, of course, fight for it in peaceful means. And, and the, the final point? The third one is understanding the cosmos as a whole, like that we are, shall not be egoist, but that we have to understand that when we, destroy something at one place, it has an effect at another place, no matter how small the destruction is. Okay, I think that was an incredible discussion. I personally feel a little overwhelmed by all of the information. I think you said a lot of very good points. I think this um, edition would be uh, even a very good uh, material for people that are in college and they are going through like a course uh, on like uh, Eastern philosophy, uh, but also for everybody that is interested in the subject in general, because you articulated every idea quite well. And I think the information is very well presented in academic terms. Now, thank you everybody for listening. We will have a future post next week and please sus subscribe to our, our channel and uh, leave your thoughts in the comment section below. We are more than pleased to hear your thoughts, your suggestions, and maybe if you have some extra questions regarding the subjects that we discuss in each podcast. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.